So, Ricardo, uh, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, we are all here for your presentation. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. And as it was said, I'm going to talk about brain machine interfaces. But I'm just going to steal the idea of the previous presenter and I start with a question. Uh, but you don't have to answer right now. So, it was said before that people that were here were optimistic people. So, the challenge for you or the question for you is to try to figure out at the end of my talk whether I'm an optimistic person or a pessimistic person. I'm going to talk about brain machine interfaces. What are these neurotechnologies, these neuroprosthetic devices, these brain machine interfaces? You may have heard about that. There have been a lot of news about that in the media. Uh, these are systems that allow us to have a direct connection between our nervous system and artificial devices. <clears throat> these are systems that allow us to stimulate the peripheral nerves so as to send signals that can help to restore tactile sensation in amputees. These are technologies that can be used to promote the recovery of certain capabilities in people who have paraplegia after spinal cord injury. These are techniques that allow us to bypass brain lesions to reconnect the brain activity in the cortex with the body. And by doing so, we can promote changes in the brain itself that help to the recovery of these lost motor capabilities. These are technologies that using electrical stimulation in deep areas in the brain help to alleviate the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Or when applied non-invasively, can produce improvement in certain cognitive tasks. So these are technologies that can interact with our central and peripheral nervous system can provide ways for us to take the information from the brain to the external world without using the only means that mankind has known since its existence, which is the own body. We can change the way we interact with the environment. How does this work? This whole idea relies on the hypothesis that we can build models of how the brain activity reflects our intentions and our actions. So let's take an example. If I want to move my left hand, then at the same time measure the activity in the brain, we'll see something like that. These are actual recordings from implanted electrodes in the cortex of a person. Uh, it was at the Shuv in Lausanne. And we can see that in these signals there are different patterns. There are moments where we have very clear oscillations and there are other moments when these oscillations decrease. And when we look at this, why is this happening? When is this happening? We can see that these oscillations appear when the person is not moving. And they disappear when the person starts to move. When we are at rest, our cortex is basically just drumming at a constant beat. And this rhythm is, bro is broken when we try to perform certain actions. So if we have these models, and then we take that information and we link it with a system that is something like this, where we can have technology that can measure the activity, take these signals, and pass it through a series of algorithms there that will compare the current activity with these models. Then we can infer what are the intentions, the actions, of the, or the state of this particular person. And then using that information, we can take that, infor that information outside. We can translate that into commands that will be executed in the real world. And then this person here will see an effect. We'll see a causal relation between his mental activity and something that happens in the external world. And this will allow this person to learn how to control these devices. And based on that is how we can do plenty of things. But if we look at what's behind a little bit more in detail, we can see that we have right now plenty of choices on how to measure the brain activity. We can have the electrodes inside the brain, we can have the electrodes outside of the scalp. We can have sensors that measure electrical activity, sensors that use light to measure this activity. So there are plenty of options there. At the same time, there are plenty of ways where I can process this activity. There are plenty of approaches I can use to build these models. 
And once I have built these models and can take an inference of what this person is trying to do, then I have multiple ways to translate them into actions. I can use virtual reality, I can use robotics, exoskeletons, I can use a computer, I can use actual electrical stimulation to the own body of the user, and all of that to fulfill different purposes. So we, are, we can also see that we are not talking about a single technology, we're talking about a system of systems. And within all these elements, we have also emerging technologies. So we are complexifying things, as it was said before. And with all these different technologies that compose a brain-machine interface, of course, we will have inherent challenges, inherent unknowns, inherent risks. But, of course, it's a very, very promising technology. We are very excited to be able to do things like this, where we can have a person with an implanted electrode that can control a robotic arm. We can have people that may recover partially or totally certain motor capabilities, and this is, of course, exciting. This, this generates a lot of positive feelings in society. But at the same time, this involves the possibility of meddling with our inner self, with our brain, with our nerves, and how these technologies are used may, of course, be a source of certain levels of anxiety. And we can always go to science fiction to identify where the anxiety in society is actually hold. So these are the kind of images that we may have on what can be positive or negative when we use these technologies. And these may seem like toy examples of what can be good, what can be wrong. But we have also real examples. We have actual people that contact us, that tell us of their hopes. This is a case of one person whose uh, child has cerebral palsy and see a possibility of these technologies on bringing new ways for communicating and control. This is a positive aspect. But we have also these cases. We have this case, this person who believes that his thoughts, that his brain activity is being remotely monitored by security agencies. And this is people who call themselves the targeted individuals. Pretty much every known researcher on uh, this field receives these two types of messages. How do we react to that? So this is an evidence, a clear show that these technologies, the development of these technologies, the research on these technologies is not only a matter of science and, of science and tech. It's a matter of social issues. And we may take this kind of messages and this kind of message with different type of reactions. We may say, this is impossible. The current technology is not able to achieve that but that doesn't change the suffering that this person has. The claims, they don't have to be real to have a real impact in society. And this is something that we have to be aware. And this is something that we have to discuss. And this is something where we have to take ownership of the narrative to explain not only how good we are, but also what are, what are our limitations in order to control this. So if we think about this, and if we think about this, it's worth to think about what can go wrong. What are these different scenarios that we don't want these technologies to evolve to? So you take the idea of mind reading, which is the way some people uh, interpret these technologies, and I don't like at all that. So if people think about mind reading, there are some concerns that may appear, and one evident of that is the privacy. So I'm a still owner of my thoughts. Someone can easily snoop of what I'm thinking. If my actions, and my intentions are now not directly translated by my body, but by an artificial system from which I don't know entirely how, it, how does it work, and I don't have control of how it is designed, what happens if something is wrong, if the system does something that I'm not actually intended to? And what if that has some negative consequences? Who's liable there? So how do we tackle that? What if this liability, am I accountable for things that have been extracted from my mind that I am not conscious, that I don't want to voluntarily uh, reveal? So does this bring a space for new risks? So there is the whole uh, risk that are linked to data and the ownership, the management, and the protection of data. And how this is managed. Can I be profiled based on this data? 
So these are all things, those examples, thought examples of can, what can go wrong. If we go on the other side, not on the reading, but on the stimulation of the brain, I try to change some cognitive capabilities for the good. What does it mean in general? So if everything changes and everybody is changed to improve certain capabilities, do we lose certain diversity in the population? Is it something that we want or not? If we say that we can change processes in the brain and we can shape adaptive processes there so that people can recover capabilities in rehabilitation, are we sure that we can only produce positive effects? Or can we have maladaptive effects? Because we don't have enough information about that. And if these technologies can improve capabilities and only a part of the population can afford them, so that means that we are having a technology as a driver of inequality in society. And these are only a few examples of what we know, and there are plenty of unknown unknowns. So this tells us some of the things that we have to take into account when we think about that. And when we look at that figure, what we see is a lot of uncertainty. What we see a lot of things that may go wrong. And I will claim that this is something that doesn't help us a lot, a, a, at all because this graph is showing the scenarios without telling us how likely they are, without telling us how feasible they are in the short, in the mid, and in the long term. We are taking all these risks just at once. We are really seeing what do they actually mean. And when we look at that, we may feel that we are basically helpless. But what we need to go is to really take this at the face and identify what is going on. We can see, for instance, that some of these risks are not exclusive to neural technologies, that are shared with other emerging technologies, and they have to be tackled in that proper way. We can think that this is about data, social media. We can think about this liability and translation is something that is shared with semi-autonomous systems, self-driving cars, for example. But all this uncertainty on how we approach technologies that leads to panic. And when we panic, we take bad decisions by definition. And one thing that has, in my opinion, feed, fed this, uh, this uh, reaction and this uncertainty is that we talk a lot about disruption at something that appears instantaneously on time that is gonna change our world and for which we haven't seen, we haven't seen it coming and we have no control at all. And, uh, this may not be the right approach to see how these emerging technologies are deployed in society. And then my modest proposal is to talk less about disruption and talk more about transition. These technologies are developing. They are by definition things that are developing. When they become available, they are not finished products. And nobody knows entirely how do they react when they are deployed in society? How will they be used? What will be these unexpected consequences? So when we think not in terms of a disruption that happens once with finished products that someone knows entirely what is gonna happen or, so, or someone is actually manipulating, but we think about a transition, then this shark that is lurking underwater is nothing else than a school of fish that we can track with some kind of sonar. A very crappy one, I recognize. We don't know entirely, but it's something that we can start foreseeing. We can start acting in a proactive manner about how this transition is done. And we are not a helpless person that has to suffer the effects of disruption, but we can be actors on how this ship is steered to face this school of fish. And people have said, do artifacts have politics? We ask also, do technologies have ethics? Do the transition period has moral values? And if we want to think about the transition period that has moral values that is responsible, then we have to think about the right here, right now of all these technologies, and not only those breakthroughs. And just for as an example, if we think about BMI, uh, brain machine interfaces, we see that most of the systems that exist right now, where we have seen all these nice videos, are not ready to be deployed by the public. We don't have information about how they perform in long term. We don't have much information of how can we actually put one of these 
at the hands of the users. Most of these are one-shot demonstrations. And this is something that we have to take into account when we draw this map about the, the, the negative scenarios that may happen because then we start reducing uncertainty. We can control uncertainty with knowledge. And we deal with knowledge by actually inquiring, by practicing. Now, there are a lot of accessibility to information, to tools, and we have to be, as developers, as researchers, and as consumers, more active on knowing what is really behind these technologies. So that we are not suffering them, but we can actually steer them in a way that really leads to those uh, scenarios that we want. And in the field of responsible innovation, it has been proposed that we have to think about the deployment of emerging technologies as a social experiment. Why? Because these technologies, as I said already, they're unfinished products. We don't know their impact, and it's impossible for the developers, for the innovators, for the researchers, to know the impact of these technologies in society until they have been deployed there. And we have to live with that. We have to acknowledge that, so that we have to act accordingly. So if this is a social experiment and we recognize that like that, we have to take into account what we normally do with experiments. Participants have to give informed consent. People that are involved, all the stakeholders, they should know what are the known risks and benefits. And more importantly, and this is the part that is mostly missing right now, they should be aware that there are unknowns. And they should be willing to take the risk of these unknowns. If this is a social experiment, we have to ask ourselves if there is a moral reason for doing it or if we can afford not to do it. And this applies, not the technology as a whole, this applies of instantiations of the technology. We should ask this question when we decide what, how, and, and in which, and to whom the technologies are deployed. And last but not least, if this is a social experiment, we have to monitor what's going on. So the responsibility lies not only on putting the technology at the hands of people, but also on tracking what are the effects and being ready to provide corrective actions if something goes wrong. We have to get ready to anticipate, and only in that way, in my opinion, we will be able to fulfill all these expectations that people have and to realize the potential that brain-machine interfaces, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, blockchain, and all the emerging technologies actually have, because we can make it but we have to take a real active participation on a steering technology. And this is a role that we all have to participate in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Ricardo. As uh, I'm sure Paul will have uh, a very nice uh, uh, matter to, to showcase the, the, on the next talk. So please uh, get ready. I have a question for you, Ricardo, very short as Paul gets re uh, uh, ready. The last message you, you gave was really a, a, about like, sort of, we have to be rigorous in the way we are, we are experimenting. Uh, this, this social experiment should be done according to the rules of, uh, of science in a way. And uh, I think it's a very strong message in, 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 in a sense that it's not only that we should be enthusiastic, we should, we should really be be enthusiastic in a way that we that we also ensure that things are going to be to be right. Um, so, are you implementing that in your in your uh, research protocols? Uh, are you doing some social experiments in the, in your in your um, in your research, or mm -hmm. not at all yet? At the level of research, uh, this is usually done. The gap in right now appears it, at the moment between the proof of concept, and the first prototypes. That's where there is not a proper uh, continuation of the work. And uh, sometimes there is also a not very clear what the goals are. Why are we developing these technologies? And which are the, um, the scenarios in which we want to deploy it? Because sometimes, and this is a, something that I I and pretty of my fellow researchers are, are, are 
quite enthusiastic about what we are doing, that sometimes we think that it's, uh, it's good in nature. But we forget that to make it really good, we have just to take into account what is the context. And then one key for doing that is involving more stakeholders. Don't, to, no, don't leave that only at the hands of the developers. Don't leave that only at the hands of the innovators. Involve end users. Go with co-design. Really interact with everybody that is involved so that you can spot sometimes these, uh, these uh, aspects that are hard to, hard to see when we are tunnel, tunnel vision and focus on how good our technology is. Thank you, Ricardo. Welcome.